and the keynote session two from none other than Michael Bolton. Hello, Michael. Hello, how are you? Good morning, early good morning. Maybe I think around 3 a.m. for you. It is, right? it is good morning, yes. It's uh, <laughs> 2.35, in uh, yeah. Toronto. Yeah, and it's uh, so now I know what it's like to work in an Indian uh, IT I, role. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, up in the middle of the night. Uh huh. And doing some handshakes with the offshore team, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Here we are. Okay. Fine. So let me take this opportunity to welcome Michael and then to give a short introduction about him. Actually, and frankly speaking, he doesn't need an introduction because when his profile comes in front of me, I always call him as testing guru. He is a teacher. He is a coach, wonderful instructor. I'm a big fan of all his blogs, which you can get to see at developsense.com slash blog. He is a specialist when it comes to rapid software testing. So this is a wonderful introduction, short introduction, which I did just for the sake of formality. I would like to request others to please go on mute. And then today, uh, he's going to deliver it. Nitraj, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. So I just said that this was a short introduction from my side and uh, just for the sake of formality. And today, he's going to deliver a keynote session on demonstration, experiment, and testing. Uh, so with this introduction, I think I would like to hand it over to Michael, over to you, Michael. Thank you, Patil. I appreciate the uh, the introduction, and it's a, a very nice and uh, very kind. I appreciate that. Um, I uh, it, it, this is sort of weird, not being able to see myself. Ah, ah, this is uh, a very strange. To um, uh, oh, now something bad is. Happened. What happened here now? There we go. There I am. Um, <laughs> uh, this is Microsoft Teams, so we uh, uh, expect virtually anything. So, all right, here we go. Um, I am here today to bring us to, uh, I think, what is the essence of testing, and that is about science testing is all about science and you all have disappeared uh i hope you are seeing the right screen i believe you must be there we go once again at some bizarre behavior from teams there this instrument is what was the most sophisticated and uh, advanced scientific instrument of its day. It is something called the air pump. And um, I first heard about this uh, uh, several years ago through a, uh, a radio series that I heartily recommend to everybody. Um, it is uh, uh, called uh, How to Think About Science. And uh, it's very Googleable. You can you can look it up. It's on CBC Radio. Um, and the first interview, I guess, in this uh, series is uh, with a fellow named Simon Schaffer. Fascinating interview, in which he discusses a book that he co-wrote with a fellow named Stephen Shapin called *Leviathan and the Air Pump*. And in that. Uh, uh, interview, he tells a little story about this incredible device and about this fellow, Robert Boyle, who, along with <clears throat> Robert Cook, excuse me, Robert Hook, a little frog in my throat, um, essentially started the whole process of scientific investigation. Um, and uh, those experiments were on the air. He developed something called experimental philosophy. He did experiments on the air because they wanted to learn things about 
the circulation of the blood amongst other things. So he and his colleagues developed a, a set of protocols for doing scientific investigation. One was you work with instruments and machines to perform experiments. You bring people together in the same place to witness a demonstration of the findings of the experiments. And then you document the experiment in a, a, a form, a, a, an account, a, a written account that is designed to be read by people who weren't even there in order to bring readers uh, uh, close to the event. Um, it's something that uh, Shapin and Schaffer call virtual witnessing, a, a style of writing that was very specific. And then you produce plans and procedures so that other people can reproduce the experiment. And uh, so Boyle and Hook uh, published, among other things, uh, plans to build this instrument so that you could do these experiments and reproduce them yourself, uh, a glass ball and a, a sort of pump down here that sucked the air out of the ball and um, a, a valve by which you could let the air back in. Um, and they did all kinds of interesting things. They uh, put lit matches in or candles and the, the candles went out. They put in uh, small animals, uh, mice and so on. And the mice after a few minutes uh, uh, started to convulse and then, and then died. And there's accounts of all the experiments that they did uh, in their writings. And they felt, they believed that they were on the verge of uh, this new form of knowledge, an institution of knowledge that they called experimental philosophy. Around the same time came some objections by this fellow. His name is Thomas Hobbes. He was one of the most uh, uh, prestigious uh, uh, philosophers of the era. This is the era around 1660, 1661. And he had a number of objections to Boyle and Hooke's experiments. First thing he said was, you can't prove these things uh, uh, as, uh, as scientific facts. They didn't even use the word science until uh, uh, 50 years later or so. He said, you can't, you can't use these in order to produce matters of fact, because among other things, the machines didn't work very well. That reminds me a lot of testing today. Our testing tools that are designed to demonstrate that the product works, uh, they're focused on repetitions of checks of output. And those demonstrations can't deal very well with some of the simplest things that we would be able to do ourselves if we were interacting with the product directly. Uh, if you resize the browser window, many of these tools fall over. If you scroll in the browser window, uh, do that while the uh, experiment is going on or the demonstration is going on, the, the uh, uh, tool falls over. Elements that don't appear on the screen at the appropriate time, they confuse the protocol through the, the demonstration. Um, things that should or should not be there. The, the tool is not aware of those things unless we program those things explicitly. And the tools aren't very hip to recognizing desirable changes in the product. Now, all this stuff was true 25 years ago. Um, and recently I wrote a, a couple of blog posts on uh, a two popular tools. You can expect that series to continue, but the problems that I was experiencing are nothing new. There was a tool that automated the browser called Sammy. I was playing with that tool. I was interacting with that tool, trying to use that tool in 2005, and I ran into all kinds of problems, and yet the tool claimed to have solved those problems, but didn't. These should look awfully familiar to you. For instance, thanks to a suggestion by Danny Fott, who's a, a fellow I respect and who's been in this tool space for a long time, you no need to uh, uh, use wait for document complete or wait for busy in your SAMI scripts. Huh, sounds a little selenium-ish, don't you think? Then uh, uh, they also, around the same time, the, the author of SAMI uh, introduced a, a GUI tool that would help you write automation scripts. 
But these problems with these recording and playback tools still exist to this day. So this is nothing new, these kinds of problems. And in fact, these are problems that even Hobbes was talking about, <laughs> although with different kinds of tools, uh, way back in the uh, uh, 1660s. Another objection that Hobbes had was that experiments were theory laden. They were based on a theory. That it, what he was saying was your tools and your demonstrations uh, are not really experiments because what you're doing is you're demonstrating that the theory is true, which is used to corroborate the idea that the theory works. How do you know the theory works? Because the demonstration comes off successfully. How do you know what success is supposed to be? Because it's in line with the theory. This is a lot like the modern day too. We have a theory about the goodness of the product. And the goodness of the product theory is based on well, can it do something? For instance, can the user log into the system? And we write a little program to have the user log into the system and the login prompt uh, appears and is read by a, a, a tool somewhere. And everybody says, marvelous, marvelous. But there's way more to logging in than that. I spent uh, about an hour a few years back, just brainstorming, spritzing on my own without any help from anybody else, a list of things that we might consider not so good if they don't happen to happen during a login. These are all kinds of things that could appear or um, that cause problems or that could be could represent difficulties. And I know they're too small to read at this point. Um, time constraints don't allow me to zoom in, but I'll tell you what, if you drop me an email, I will gladly send you a, a, a an HTML version of this so you can scroll around. And it's not designed to be a thorough testing protocol. It's designed to be an example of what we would look for or what we would consider if we bothered to spend an hour or so thinking about all the things that could go wrong in a login process. Then Hobbes also said, just because something happens once in one place, who's to say it'll happen again the next time or somewhere else? Seeing something once isn't enough, said Hobbes. You've got to analyze and reason. And in order for an experiment to have a validity for, for Hobbes, it would have to be done in all kinds of places, not just in some drawing room in Pall Mall in London, as the uh, uh, scientists of the day were doing. That reminds me of the problem of validity in science, and that reminds me of the problem of validity in testing too. These fellows, Kirk and Miller, in qualitative research, because testing is qualitative research, identify three different kinds of validity, synchron or of uh, reliability rather. Synchronic reliability is reliability where your observations are the same within the same period of time. Something happening over here and something over ha happening over here and something happening over here in the same way at the same time. Diachronic right, reliability, big fancy words, huh? Um, is about something happening successively over time. And then there's this really interesting form of reliability that they bring up, which I worry about in software testing a lot, which is quixotic reliability. That is reliability that looks real, but isn't. Circumstances in which one form of observation consistently yields a consistent result, an unvarying measurement. Now, the, exam, the example that they give in their book is that of a broken thermometer. Now, a broken thermometer gives a perfectly reliable reading. It's just the same every time, irrespective of the temperature of the thing that it's measuring. And the trouble with this kind of reliability, uh, 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 Kirk and Miller say in their book, is that it's trivial and misleading. It, it only proves that you've managed to observe or uh, find out party line information. And that can be true of surveys, and that can be true of automated checks, and that can be true of scripted tests. The program faithfully returns the same result or the, the user returns the same result when we're not asking probing questions. I mean, the, the canonical example of that is when we ask somebody, how are you? And they say, uh, I'm fine. Or they say, 
I'm okay. And they don't actually tell you how they really are. There are social uh, uh, factors at work. So uh, sometimes a more a variation in the question is a, a more important thing to do if you want to get to the bottom of how somebody's actually feeling. You might want to observe that they you notice that they look a little tired. Are you feeling a little tired today? And they 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 might give a different answer at that point. So once again, like a broken thermometer, a check that ran green yesterday might run green today, but not because the product is fine, but because the check is broken. Green checks, I've noticed, get very little attention. Uh, when a test, uh, when a, a check runs red and, and gives us a red result, uh, we often pay attention to that. We take notice of that. But why should we be sure that the product is okay just because the checks are running green? We'll return to that point. Boyle also claimed that people having seen a demonstration will automatically agree that everything's okay. Well, Hobbes disagreed, and as a tester, I, I disagree with that too. Just because somebody shows me that the product can work doesn't convince me at all that the product will work. As a tester, I need to experiment. I need to explore. I need to experience the product in order to form a reasoned belief that everything's okay. Because what I'm looking for as a tester is I'm looking for problems. I don't want to see a smooth demonstration. I want to investigate the problems and interact the product and interact with it so that I can surface problems. Of course, it works the other way too. If I report as a, a, a tester, if I report a bug, the developer will often say, uh, well, here's a, a de I, I'll say to the de developer, look, the bug's right here. And the developer will say, just a second. I don't think that's a bug. No user would ever do that. It works on my machine. So here are things from 360 years ago now resurfacing in exactly the same way that uh, uh, they did back then. So let's look at these things closely. The difference between demonstration and experiment. A demonstration is designed to show what we know. An experiment or a test is designed to challenge what we think we know. A demonstration often requires lots of rehearsal for a smooth performance. The idea behind a demonstration is to make sure that everything goes smoothly. An experiment can show that there's a problem in, in the product as a one-off event. All we have to do is find one case where the product isn't working to, to form a, a reasonable opinion that there's a bug. A repetition for a demonstration shows desirable consistency. Doing the same thing can reveal, trying to do the same thing can reveal interesting inconsistencies when we take those things as uh, uh, experiments. Now, there's a difference in, in qualitative research between repetition and reproduction. Uh, doing the same thing exactly the same way is all right in one sense, but I want to be able to do things using a, a, a different set of data or a different sequence of events. If I'm doing things in ways that are in some sense the same and are in some sense different, I can reveal interesting inconsistencies in the product of the behaviors of the product that might be pointing towards a bug. Inconsistency in results in a demonstration is undesired and troubling, but for a tester, it's food. <laughs> inconsistency in results is welcomed and intriguing because we want to investigate that and find out if there's a problem here in the product. In a demonstration, we don't want to rock the boat too much. Varying the factors is risky. It might upset or undermine or, or uh, um, um, cause the demonstration not to do exactly what we want it to do. In an experiment, variation of factors is desirable and may even improve the experiment. It may even uh, help us to learn something about the product that we didn't know. The idea behind an experiment is to keep risk under a lid. That's in a demonstration, in an experiment. What we want to do is identify the risk and bring it forward, bring it to our attention. In a demonstration, deeper truths are kind of swept away beside the point. In an experiment, deeper truths are the goal. 
So those are some of the key differences between demonstration and experiment. And these are some of the key differences, I think, between the kinds of things that are being called testing these days, but that really aren't. Repeatedly checking to make sure the program can do something over and over again, but can work does not mean does work, and it doesn't mean real work. To a builder, to a developer, to a designer, a test in their heads might be a checkable example, or, or it might be a, a checklist item to check off, you know, something in our definition of done. It might be an obstacle to overcome, a, a hurdle to jump over. To developers and designers, a test is very often a demonstration. But to testers, verification that a product works. That's what some people say that, that uh, they're there to do as testers. I'm here to make sure the product works. But notice that that's not logically possible. You can't show that the product, you can't verify that the product works until you've seen the product under every possible set of sequences, every possible set of conditions, every possible piece of data that you could throw at it. And you'd have to be sure that you're never going to find something new if you're verifying that the product works. Verification is not logically possible until the product is done and we're all dead and gone. At that point, we could say, all right, everybody was happy with it. Nobody complained. But we can't verify that you can't verify statements about the future until we've been to the future. Now, what's the big deal about all this in testing? Well, a fellow who's been very influential on me and on James and on a bunch of us, a guy named Gar uh, Harry Collins, uh, wrote a book a couple of years back called Why Democracies Need Science. And I'm sometimes tempted to go through that book and just strike out democracies <laughs> and, and write out why software organizations and then I cross out science and replace it with testing because look at how similar these things are. Harry talks about the formative aspects of science, the basic principles, the ideas behind it. One of them is observation. If you want to know about some feature of the world, Harry says, does one prefer to listen to one who's observed that feature of the world or one who hasn't? We need, I think, to observe the product directly, to interact with it, to learn about it experientially, if we're going to say that we've tested it. As Harry says, we prefer to give more weight to the one who has observed, even though we know that the observation is inexact and impure, open to illusions, and it's observe, uh, 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 vulnerable to observer effects, it's vulnerable to the influence of the social group. Even though that's true, it's better, I think, to have our eyes and our ears and our hands and our feelings on the software. Another formative aspect of science is corroboration. We prefer to give weight to the outcome of experiments that have been successfully replicated over, over those which have not. So replication is a big deal. We're not saying that checks are bad. We're saying that checks are not complete. Another problem that corroboration runs into is the problem of what Harry calls experimenters' regress, a paradox. Um, how do you know that the test was correct? Well, because it got the expected result. But how do you know it got the expected result? Well, because the test was correct. Now, for something that's documented, we've got another uh, a source of, of corroboration. We've got another oracle that can highlight the possibility of a problem or can suggest no problem if that oracle doesn't fire, if it doesn't tell us no problem. Or if, if it doesn't tell us there's a problem, we assume there's no problem. But we gotta be careful about that. We gotta be careful about doing that over and over again because as Kirk and Miller say, back in that other book, Reliability and Validity and quality, Qualitative Research, most of the technology of confirmatory non-qualitative research, they say, in both the social and the na uh, natural sciences is aimed at preventing discovery. It's bad news if a theory has to be overturned. So when confirmatory research, demonstrations, go smoothly, everything comes out just as expected and received theory is supported by one more example of its usefulness and requires no change. But then Kirk and Miller drop the bomb. They say, as in everyday social life, confirmation is exactly the absence of insight. Testing is not about showing that the product can work. Testing is about discovery. 
It's about investigation. It's about learning about where the product doesn't work or where it might not work or where there might be risk that we haven't noticed before. And in science, as in life, and as I would argue in testing, Kirk and Miller say, dramatic new discoveries must almost by definition be accidental, serendipitous. Indeed, they only occur in the consequence of some mistake, some mistake about the ideas that we had about the product. Here's the, the thing I said I was gonna come back to about the idea of no problem. If we test and we see a problem, well, the idea that we're seeing a problem, that might be false. It could be that the test process alerted us to a problem, but it wasn't there, it was a false alarm. Another outcome though, could be that the test process detected a problem and it's a real bug. Yay, we found a bug. Let's look at the no problem side. When we don't see a problem, it might be because the product is in fact working fine. But if we see no problem, maybe that's because the test process is inadequate or broken in some way, such that it doesn't reveal a problem that exists. All right, I'm hearing a little back talk. How am I doing for time? <laughs> or did somebody unmute accidentally? You, you, you have still five minutes. Five minutes, oh no, because I want to show you a demonstration. I want to show you a demonstration. How am I green misleader harmless, harm us? Well, look, uh, it could be that a check wasn't performed even though we thought it was. It could be that the results weren't actually connected to the protocol. The green might be referring to something else that wasn't in the check. The check could be too shallow or it could be wasteful or unnecessary. Uh, it could be controversial. The product might have changed since the check has been performed. Or maybe we've got this huge body of checks and we don't know what they actually do. And so we don't have a basis for declaring responsibly that everything's okay just because the check ran green. Or the checks might have been running green. We might have understood them ages ago, but we haven't reviewed them in a long time. Now, what do we prefer? What kind of world do we prefer, asks Harry. Do we prefer a world in which those who claim to make observations are willing to set out the conditions in which they're gonna be shown to be wrong? That is, are we willing to invite the test or do we prefer a word, world where that would be considered unnecessary or inappropriate? Well, Harry talks a lot about demonstration in this book, The Gollum at Large, What You Should Know About Technology, but I think it's probably more powerful to show you a little example of this. And in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to stop sharing and reshare for a sec, because I don't think I remembered to uh, turn on my sound. And that's a problem, even though we rehearsed it, See, there can still be problems. Uh, I'm now going to include the system audio, and I'm now going to share the screen and uh, let me know if you can see the video. Yeah, we can. We can. All good. Good. All right. Great. This is a demonstration uh, done by Waymo on their free to sell product. There's a bunch of things I'd like to do. Look at this happy book. Michael, your voice is very feeble. What's that? Yeah. Michael, we can't hear you. Can't hear my voice. Okay. Well, let's see. Ah, we did rehearse this beforehand. Um, let's Sorry see. Okay. Uh, why so? Is why so video down? was coming, Ma Michael? Why yeah. so? Video was coming correctly, but with respect to that, your voice become a little feeble. Yes. How about this? Uh, here we go. A little bit better. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. Is that better yeah. now? Yes, okay. better, Michael. All right. See, there you go. And there's a car stopping. Now, I'd like you to notice something about this. First of all, there's not very many cars on the street. Look, big empty street here. And, oh, what a surprise. There are three of these taxis all in the same place at the same time. What we're seeing here is something that's pretty evidently been staged. It's a clear sunny day, as it always is in this area in Arizona where they're checking uh, these cars out, where they're, they're filming this demonstration. The streets are wide, they're empty, there's no snow. This does not look a whole bunch like Bangalore or Hyderabad, to which I say to the Waymo people, good luck with your thing. By contrast, here is JJ Ricks. JJ Ricks 
rides around in these vehicles and takes a camera with him that uh, uh, yeah, I, and I monitors the screen of all my rides and multi stop um, trips make it more complicated the, to keep uh, track of the, the collects time the Excel when spreadsheet starts and stops and uh, I'll just but, advance this a little okay. bit cuz I know we're a little bit low on time here he goes to so the parking coming lot coming up we've got a left turn right turn go around a little the car seems there. to be doing pretty well there's lots of interesting turns coming up so see what we get and here he is at the intersection and whoop the car goes over oh. the curb you see the car wobble like that <laughs> yeah. now he goes along for a little spicy bit. right into that and then he comes yeah, to an see, intersection same road. what i want to point right. out about this intersection yeah. is no over here the orange cone oh so how are we going to turn right when the white lane here, is closed off under orange orange. you can just barely see it what is the, uh, the planner can... still wants to go in this lane the uh, can I zo oh, I can't zoom out. machinery can see Oh, did they finally block off the buttons when when there's a turn? And notice he's uh, oh, no, they didn't. bugs. Okay, all right, I thought they go. saw my feedback. And but no, notice. Oh, I think it's, I don't the think it's going to take this the turn. The car is not going. I don't think it's going to take this turn. <laughs> we might be stuck. <laughs> and then a fellow comes up behind him in a truck. Sorry. And he can't do anything about it. He's sitting in the back seat of the car. He's specifically instructed not to get in the front. It's a self-driving car. And he waits. Well, and he waits. Sure, it looks like your and car it, has paused. Then he's Audrey on the phone with Texas. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And then a couple of minutes later, three minutes later, he's been waiting. He's still there. And all of a sudden, spontaneously, oh. the car starts it's, up. Uh, okay. And it gets around the corner. There you go. And it counters and tries to go in the right hand lane. Counters the cone. I don't think it was supposed to do that. And stops dead. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. Well, it actually, did it pause again? It looks like it did. Oh, now it's blocking the entire road. Uh, <laughs> A few minutes Wait, later. In one minute. What does notice the map here. Is? The cars have to drive into uh, lanes of oncoming traffic. Yeah, don't know exactly. In order for uh, uh, them to avoid him. Yeah, my app says 12. Notice there's another the bug there. Says this one. says he's going to be there in one minute. The other app says uh, 12 minutes. And then I, okay, the so car finally figures out. it out, backs up, uh, and then stops dead again. And now things are really uh, bad because now it's blocking this entire lane, not just a part of it. Very interesting. Cars coming in behind him. He's blocking traffic. So this out. is what happens and, in real uh, life. Now it's blocking the whole lane instead of half of it. So I uh, uh, encourage you very strongly to go out and uh, uh, have a look at Joel Ricks's site and to see some of the adventures that he's had as he's tried to uh, test this stuff. So to serious testers, a test is not verification that a product works. It might be confirmation that the product can work, but not proof that it does. A test might be a means to understanding the actual status of the product, a performance, not, a, not an artifact, not a script, and not an automated check, a challenge, an experiment. All right, so what are the conclusions? Let's look back on our tools. We're working with tools built on other, by other people. So one of the things we have to take into account when we're uh, doing uh, uh, experiments is we gotta figure out whether the tools work and whether we trust the makers of it. And these tools have lots of problems and bugs, as my recent blogs will show. Uh, the tester's mission is not the same as a builder's mission. The tester's mission helps to serve that mission, but the tester's mission is not the same as those who build the product. The builder's mission is to build a valuable product. The tester's mission is to understand the product we've got and threats to it value through experimentation. The tester's mindset, therefore, can't be the same as the builder's mindset. It's our job to get to the heart of the matter, not to show that everything's okay. Reliability is seductive. Disru discovery is disruptive. And we've got to be psychologically and emotionally and politically prepared for that. Social forces uh, might cause us to weaken our resolve to show what the product actually does rather than to show what somebody hopes it. Uh, it does. 
So there you go, um, a, a whirlwind tour through demonstration and experiment and how they relate to software testing. And if you want to uh, uh, end with an important uh, uh, thing, as scientists, we're scientists as testers, we're not marketers. It's our job to find out what the product actually does so that the people who are building it can decide whether the product they've got is the product they want. There you go. There we are. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to uh, uh, answer your questions by mail uh, or uh, by any other means you might uh, choose. I'm not too hard to find on the internet. Superb. Thank you so much, Michael, for your wonderful thoughts as usual, insightful and bringing in uh, all the wonderful insights from uh, the knowledge which you have uh, so far. And then I could read it out from one of the comments from the chats. Brilliant analogy, highly engaging, and interesting talk, Michael. I especially like the two things, the demo part of it, as well as yes. the way you tried to compare demonstration versus experimentation. And the way you said it, it's not at all marketing or sales, it's science as well as art. So an experience. It's about getting experience. experience too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Experiencing the product is really important. Yeah. Indeed. So I cannot see more questions on the chat. Uh, so meanwhile, I will again ask all the participants if they have any questions, then please, please ask me anything. All your questions in the chat. It and meanwhile, the I do have yeah. In the meanwhile, I do have a few questions for you. The way you said it, like while doing the verifications and validations through discovery approach, you look at here, you look at there. So any tips and tricks you would like to share with all of us on looking at the things across testing environments, dev, QA, staging, prod. Sometimes it becomes really difficult for us to have the sync in between all the test environments. Any practical tips, tricks you would like to share? Well, I guess uh, um, one way I would put it, I suppose, is that it's our job to reveal problems in the product. And if there's anything that threatens our capacity to do that, we in, in rapid software testing, we don't call that a bug, we call that an issue. An issue is anything, or a bug is anything that threatens the value of the product. Anything about the product that threatens its value. An issue is anything about the test process that threatens its value. And if we pause and think about it for a moment, what we'll recognize is that any given issue <laughs> might be, yeah, it's uh, wonderful how people uh, um, <laughs> unmute. unmute everybody and I'll mute myself. Yeah, I just Sorry. muted all. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> me, including me, you unmuted. Uh, uh, the, it's a, <laughs> That's an MS Teams for you. <laughs> yeah, it's MS Teams. There you go. Um, what I was saying was um, an issue is anything that threatens the value of the test process or the testing project. And if we pause and think about it for a sec, it'll occur to us that any given issue might be more important than any bug that we've found so far because something that makes testing harder, slower, less trustworthy, less reliable, less valuable, is something that allows bugs more time and more opportunity to hide. And then by definition, the bugs that we found so far are the easiest bugs to find so far with what we've got. So those issues may be blocking our capacity to become aware of other bugs. So um, if we're seeing, for example, differences between various environments uh, that are salient, that are important to the testing, if uh, especially if we see a, a, a distinction between a pre-production environment and a failure by that pre-production and modern, uh, pre-production environment to model the real world, there's risk. 
the risk is that our experiments will uh, uh, not be uh, valid because they won't reflect how things go on in the real world. Now that's hard, it's hard to do that. Um, but it's also not hard to spot the differences and to, to ask our sponsors, to ask our clients. The production environment and the real world aren't the same. Are you okay with that risk? It's a really important question for testers to be asking all the time because we don't control the product, we don't control the budget, we don't control those things, but we can shine light on these things and ask our client, are you okay with this? Are you willing to accept this risk? The client's okay with it, I have to be okay with it too. But it's my job to help the client understand that risk and to, to explain uh, uh, that to them so that they can see there is business risk. Uh, um, we can't assume that just because we performed a test means that it's gonna play out that way in the real world. We do our best to represent real world conditions and to represent real world users and to, to learn and understand those people deeply. But there's always a risk that our testing is going to be incomplete with respect to the big wide world outside. Very well said, Michael. And with the real data also, right? Mm, absolutely, especially yeah. in these days of, of AI. Uh, my goodness, uh, uh, we've seen already lots and lots of cases where we got two big problems with data. One, the data set is too small relative to what the real world is like, and it's all about the past. All the AI models that are getting developed are based on past knowledge, not current knowledge. If you want to see a wonderful example of that, look at the difference between COVID, but pre-COVID and mid-COVID um, assessments of real estate values, for example. All those models are wrong. As soon as we've got a new salient fact in human relations, um, never mind the problems associated with gender bias and, and, and race bias and uh, uh, economic bias and so on and so forth. Machines don't understand things and it's important that we recognize they don't understand things. It's just software trying to refine an algorithm. That's what, that's what machine learning is really all about. And to call it intelligence or learning does a certain form of violence to both of those words, it seems to me. Yeah. True. Okay, so let me take another question from Vikas Yadav, who is asking us about how we can approach exploratory, exploratory testing. What should be All our tests approach? Are exploratory. <laughs> well, <laughs> if it's not exploratory, it's avoidatory. If it's not exploratory, you're 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 not doing it right. Here's here's something I would like to offer. In fact, this is in the uh, a set of slides that I didn't show. Um, Exploratory testing is, is often mislabeled or misconstrued as manual testing. And what I would like to recommend really strongly is that we drop the whole notion of manual testing because we believe that it's actually become kind of toxic. When you want to say manual testing, consider three different aspects of what happens when humans interact with software. One is we might be talking about attended testing where we need to be there to observe and to interact with the product or to, to um, help it out um, or to, to notice things that the machinery won't notice. Experiential testing. Experiential testing means that our encounter with the product to, a, to an outside observer or even to ourselves, is practically indistinguishable from a certain kind of user that we had in mind. But remember, there's lots of different kinds of users. Exploratory testing can be done even though it's not experiential or even though it's not attended. The thing about exploratory testing is about agency. It's about who is making the decisions for you in the here and now. So if those choices are made for you, if you're following a set of instructions, uh, then we would say your testing is less exploratory. If you, the only way we can have a, a, a completely unexploratory 
uh, uh, testing is at the point where a machine is following a bunch of instructions that we programmed into it. Humans don't do that. Humans don't uh, act in unscripted, or humans naturally act in unscripted ways as soon as something comes along that knocks them off the script. Uh, now, a big problem with trying to over script humans is that they won't notice problems, but you can test an API in an exploratory way by not having uh, a, a specific set of uh, uh, steps that you're going to follow, but you might have a set of observations that you want to make, a, a set of interactions that you want to have. Um, you can uh, um, uh, test an API in an exploratory way by interacting with it directly, providing it with some input and observing some output, or you can do it in an exploratory way by trying to write software addressing that API. That's an exploratory process. You're not going to have a, a, a set of instructions on uh, uh, how to write a program that executes your shopping cart. You're going to develop one. That's an exploratory process. And here's a kicker. Designing a script for someone else to follow or even for yourself to follow is an exploratory process too because there's no script that tells you how to write that script. So uh, we have a, a blog post, uh, uh, James and I do. Um, in, it's on James's blog. Um, and uh, it's about uh, exploratory testing. And it's got the abbreviation ET 3.0. Let's see if I can make it appear all of a sudden right here on the screen. Watch with the magic of macros. There we go. Satisfice.com blog archives 1509. That, by the way, was the use of uh, uh, tools that I often use in my testing. I, I, I've got a, a, a bit of uh, a scripting that I, I uh, write um, that I can do real easily to enter any kind of repeated phrase um, using a, a, a library of stuff called Auto Hotkey, and then I wrote a, a, a sort of library manager for that, and it's really great. I can just type stuff at uh, at any given moment. That is a useful form of tool use in testing. Simply awesome, yeah. Maybe by looking at uh, time, we can take one more question. And then the question oh, is from Heman Sharma. How to go beyond the requirement documents to test, whereas with limited time to test, same set of requirements? A good place to start is to say, the users aren't reading the requirements. People who are using the software aren't reading the requirements. People who are interacting with the software aren't reading the requirements. Um, Brian Merrick said something very nice about requirements many years ago. He said that requirements uh, documents are useful fictions. <laughs> they might be necessary. I would say uh, sometimes helpful, but they're not sufficient. What I would do and what we recommend in our rapid software testing classes that people do is learn the product by whatever means are available. If you've got a product, interact with it. If you've got a mock-up, learn the mock-up, play with the mock-up. If you uh, uh, have an idea of what the user's task might be, put the requirements documents aside and create a set of scenarios whereby the people who get value out of the product would actually operate it and interact with it. Um, there's a, a wonderful, um, in my opinion, of course. <laughs> that was a little immodest, pardon me. Uh, let me give you a, another uh, thing to look at. Um, that, you, you, uh, you are being too too modest today. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's just, it, it, I, I'm excited about it, so that's what I do. Um, there is a series that I wrote called Breaking the Test Case Addiction. There we go. Um, that's too long a URL, just Google it. Uh, um, the Google Develop Sense and Addiction, and you will hit the beginning of a 12-part series um, on uh, various forms of uh, uh, dropping the idea of test cases and uh, uh, refocusing on different ways of designing testing protocols that loosen us up a lot. Um, 
Remember, our job is to find problems. It's far less to confirm that each requirement has been ticked off in a box check. Um, and by the way, uh, another way of doing this is simply to interact with the product directly while having the requirements document in front of you, not writing test cases ahead of time, but saying, oh, this is something a product's supposed to do. Let me try it. Here's something else the product is supposed to do. Let me try it. This whole business of one positive test case and one negative test case, who thought that up? It's it's such a silly, you know, you know, when you go to the when you go to a restaurant, you know, you're trying out a new restaurant. You don't say, oh, well, I'm going to one order one negative meal and one positive meal. It's ridiculous. What you do is you try to experience what the restaurant is delivering uh, um, or a hotel, as, <laughs> as you say, I suppose, in uh, uh, in India more commonly. I miss India. I want to go back and visit again. It's been over a decade now should come as soon as possible <laughs> i hope so <laughs> yeah okay so with that note and uh, with those couple of questions by looking at the timeline i think uh, i could see that there are a few more questions on the chat conversation so maybe i would like to request you michael if you can address answer those uh, offline or folks can get back to you on linkedin if they um, if you, right? Yeah, or you, they could do that. Or if you want to send it to me, I'm happy to do that. Um, I do sure. want to squeeze in one more thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the Agile Testing Retreat and uh, um, Aditya and uh, um, uh, Pallavi who uh, invited me. And to you, um, uh, I can only say thank namaste. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. It was amazing. <laughs> thank session. you so much. Thanks a lot, Michael. We are grateful. Yeah, thanks a lot. We thank are you, grateful. Fella. Really good.